The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is Debbie Matulowitz speaking. Uh, I'm in the marketing department here at Sadlier. And uh, we have with us this evening, uh, quite, quite honored to have with us this evening, uh, Father Ron Lewinsky. Um, Father Lewinsky is at St. Mary of the Annunciation Parish in Mundelein, Illinois. And he'll be presenting uh, to us his presentation, as you see on your screen, The Sacrament of Penance and Reconciliation, Teaching and Celebrating the Gift of God's Peace. You'll find uh, this presentation to be um, a, 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 a travel uh, through the sacrament for your own life, as well as uh, tying it into the uh, the teaching and the lives of your students. Um, just a little bit about Father Ron uh, before we get started. He's a priest in the Archdiocese of Chicago, and as I mentioned, he's the pastor at St. Mary of the Annunciation Parish. He also serves as an Archdiocesan Dean and President of Frazzati Catholic Academy, which is the first Archdiocesan Middle School um, in, the, in the Archdiocese of Chicago. He completed his theological studies at Mundelein Seminary and at the Faculté uh, Catholique in Lyon, France, and holds a licentiate in sacred theology. Uh, Father has served as the director of Chicago's Office for Divine Worship and has taught liturgy and sacraments at Mundelein Seminary, Viola University, and the Chicago Diaconate Formation Program. Father's also served on ad hoc committees for the U.S. Bishops Committee on Divine Worship and on the advisory board of Notre Dame Center for Liturgy. Um, he's a frequent speaker on liturgy and pastoral life across North America, Australia, Germany, South Africa, and Southeast Asia. He's best known for his work with the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. He is respected as someone who is uh, in his writing his teaching and his pastoring has been able to effectively bring liturgy and catechesis, theology and pastoral life together. Um, as we begin our presentation, or just before we begin, I'll mention that everybody is muted. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about background noises. And uh, at the end of the presentation, we will go through questions and answers. So uh, please feel free to write them in, on the, in the questions box uh, for yourself. We will offer you a certificate of, of attendance that will follow up in a follow-up email. And I think that oh, covers the basis. I do also want to extend uh, those of you who were with us yesterday and have joined us again today, thank you so much for coming back. There was an, an, a glitch in the audio um, through the GoToWebinar platform, which enabled people to watch us, but unfortunately unable to hear. So th thank you very much. We appreciate your returning uh, this evening. Um, there's, there's several hundred of you out here, so uh, we, we, we thank you. And uh, for those of you who have been with us before and, and those of you who are new to us in our webinar series, uh, thank you. We really appreciate your being here. So uh, I'm sure you, you signed up to listen to Father Ron Lewinsky, not to me. So at this point, I will uh, turn over the uh, presentation. Father, uh, yes. go right ahead. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Debbie. I appreciate that. Uh, I feel like uh, a four-star general uh, with uh, a lot of uh, medals on my chest with your introduction <laughs> there. Uh, but amidst all of those medals, let me say the one that's uh, really most important and means the most to me is uh, truly uh, is being a pastor. Um, and in this case, uh, being pastor and confessor for uh, what we're uh, in terms of the presentation today. Uh, I, I'm really happy for this opportunity uh, to talk about the Sacrament of Penance and Reconciliation because it's such a gift and a treasure to the church. And again, I say that not from just some kind of theological point of view, but as a pastor and as a confessor, uh, the power of the sacrament is so evident when someone who uh, has been uh, has come to the sacrament and has been carrying the weight of their sins, uh, sometimes for years, uh, comes and hands the, all of that over to God. 
uh, you can see the change in the penitent's face, and uh, you can hear in their voice, uh, and sometimes in their tears, see in their tears, uh, both regret as well as joy. Um, and that's true for children as well as adults. Uh, as we get started, uh, why don't we uh, start with a prayer. And the prayer that I'd like to offer is taken uh, from the rite of penance, the actual ritual book of penance. And um, just a little aside here, uh, I think we forget about sometimes that, that when we talk about the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, that there is, in fact, a full ritual book. Uh, which has the various forms of the rite of penance, but also includes uh, a diversity of prayers, sample examinations of conscience, and the introduction to that document itself, which is referred to as the prenotanda, the beginning or the pastoral notes of the document, are really wonderful and uh, really should be on every uh, catechist and every pastor's uh, library shelf for reference. So as we begin, I'm going to use one of the prayers from the rite, and uh, if we just focus our minds and hearts then on the, the goodness and mercy of God. Lord God, creator and ruler of your kingdom of light, in your great love for this world, you gave up your only son for our salvation. His cross has redeemed us. His death has given us life. His resurrection has raised us to glory. Through him, we ask you to be always present among your family. Teach us to be reverent in the presence of your glory. Fill our hearts with faith, our days with good works, our lives with your love. May your truth be on our lips and your wisdom in all our actions, that we may receive the reward of everlasting life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good. Let's move ahead then, and I want to give you just a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening, um, so you get a sense of the whole uh, flow of uh, the presentation. Let me look first of all uh, at the, uh, the human dimension to this sacrament and how the human heart longs for peace. We want to look at uh, the risen Christ's gifts of peace. We want to uh, spend some time uh, talking about preparing for celebrating the sacrament. This is really a, a very important dimension. And although uh, in my remarks I'll be referring to both, uh, I hope my remarks refer both to children and adults, uh, but uh, in part four I'd like to just offer some little hints or suggestions or comments uh, in terms of preparing children for the sacrament. And then in part five, to ask that all-important question, uh, what exactly is the value of this sacrament, really? Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are not taking advantage of this sacrament. Uh, so what's missing there? How are they not uh, catching the value of this? And then finally, some pastoral uh, questions, pastoral issues. I'll offer a few, but we'll leave time so that um, our listeners can uh, type in their questions uh, as well. So let's look at the first part there, the human heart longs for peace. I, I think it's important uh, with this sacrament, if not with all the sacraments, to, to begin with our own experience in life. And I think it's true enough to say that, uh, that we all desire to be at peace, however you describe that. We desire to be at peace with the decisions that we make and the work that we do. Uh, when we take life seriously, it's, it's natural that we want to feel at peace. And yet how often, you know, as hard as we work or uh, as diligent as we are with things in our lives, uh, things don't always work the way we want them to. And we feel that, that disappointment, that discouragement, uh, and we feel out of sorts. We also want to be at peace with our family and all of our relationships. Now, everybody knows how e it's easier said than done. And also, though, we have a responsibility, each one of us, to uh, sustain those relationships, nourish them. Uh, and yet, you know, again and again, even in the best of our relationships, there are times when we feel hurt, uh, there's division, resentment, grudges, uh, broken relationships, and uh, we long for peace. We long for peace uh, when we know we've done wrong. 
Um, we usually don't even have to have anybody tell us we've done something wrong. Uh, they're right there in the pit of our stomach, uh, we can feel that something something's not right. Maybe it's a sleepless night. The regret we feel, the sense of shame or guilt, uh, is a sure sign to us uh, that we have done wrong, and we long for peace. We hunger for peace in our world. This is a, even a bigger picture. Uh, again and again, uh, we're saddened by the cruel and violent behavior in our world. Uh, injustice, war, terrorism, um, violence uh, in our streets, and uh, uh, leaves us at times with a feeling insecure or unsafe. And, and we, we cry out to God, you know, grant peace to our world, O oh Lord. We also want to be at peace when we face a crisis, an illness, or, or, or loss in our lives. Now, let me be clear that, you know, to have these feelings when you face a crisis or illness or loss doesn't mean that we are guilty of sin, but when we face that crisis, uh, when we have to carry the burden of sickness or disease, it's a question of how do we respond to that? How do we relate to the crosses that we're asked to carry? Does it put us at odds with God? Do we find ourselves turning away from God rather than turning to God? So all of these kind of incidents in our life or experiences in our life can disturb the peace uh, within our hearts and we find ourselves again longing for peace. And of course, ultimately, we want to be at peace at the time of our death. We want to be ready to say, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. And, you know, if we've been working at that uh, uh, searching for peace and desire for peace all our lives, then I would like to believe that when we come to the time of our death and our deathbed, that those words, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, will come much more easily. Ultimately, or the, the summary to all of this again, is that the Christian longs to be at peace with God. Now, many people sometimes don't even, wouldn't define it or talk about it that way. They just know that they're out of sorts. They just know that they're, um, they're anxious, they're restless, and, and they can't, they don't even see the dimension, the God dimension necessarily. But the Christian who spends some time thinking about this and praying about this begins to recognize that the true source of peace is in God. When we are at peace with God, we have a strength that can get us through anything. So to understand the inner workings of peace, we have to recognize how we are hardwired to connect with God. You know, we hear uh, in the liturgy so often, the Lord be with you, peace be with you. Doesn't that give us a clue that we're meant to be with the Lord, in communion with the Lord, and that it's His peace that has to be the grounding of our life? We were made to be in communion with God. God didn't create us to put us on a shelf or uh, place us in a glass display case for His amusement. He made us to love us. He made us so that we can be free to love Him in return. And from, you know, for thousands of years, uh, the Psalms bear this out. Listen to Psalm 42. Like the deer that yearns for running streams, so my soul is yearning for you, my God. Or Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God whom I seek. For you my flesh pines and my soul thirsts like the earth, parched, lifeless, and without water. Have you ever found yourself saying that? I certainly have. I've said that in, in, in a desire, again, for the peace that God alone can give. St. Augustine summarized our human experience very beautifully when he said, Our hearts are restless, O oh God until they rest in you. So again, what is it that disrupts our peace? Well, there are outside forces, of course, that uh, can affect us. War, different kinds of loss, illness, personal crisis. And again, to be clear, that experiencing these things uh, does not constitute a sin. 
but how we respond to them might. When we experience these kind of things, are we prone to vengeance, retaliation? Do we find ourselves getting mad at God? Or do we blast out um, against others, blame others? We lose our inner peace when we've made poor choices, especially the choices that have been harmful to others. And to remember that we're not only hardwired to connect with God, but that God has made us into family. He expects us to be in communion with one another. We are hardwired to connect with others as well. We fail to trust in the love and mercy of God, and that inevitably leads us at, odd, at odds. Um, there's a lack of peace. When faced with big challenges or losses in our lives, again, it's natural to question God. How many times I hear individuals saying, I've given up on God. I've prayed and prayed and I don't get an answer. Or I've lived a very good life and uh, this or that happened to me, so I can't, uh, I can't believe in God anymore. I don't want to trust in God anymore. Yes, those those are temptations, really, that can that uh, can disrupt our sense of peace, and those the way we respond can often be, you know, not a healthy way to respond, but rather really sin is what we find ourselves in. So ultimately, we we can say that our peace is broken when our relationship with God is ruptured by sin. Sin is again not just some kind of psychological condition but a conscious and willful act for which we are responsible. Sin is not an accident, but a deliberate choice on our part with consequences for our relationship with God. And you know, children and adults learn this early in life. Uh, if they've been raised in a healthy environment, they learn what it means to be responsible. The, Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, talks about uh, sin this way. Sin is an offense against God. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Sin sets itself against God's love for us and turns our hearts away from it. Like the first sin, it is disobedience, a revolt against God, through the will to become like God's, knowing and determining good and evil. Isn't that a beautiful way of putting it, that we, we begin to think of ourselves as God like we're in control of all things. The Catechism also tells us, sin is before all else an offense against God, a rupture of communion with Him. At the same time, it, dam it damages our communion with the Church. And that's an important thing to consider too. There's no such thing ultimately like a, uh, you might say, a private sin, because all our sin affects the whole body. So what about people, though, who say uh, that they are without sin? You know, that uh, um, occasionally I do find people who, who say, well, I'd go to confession, but, you know, I don't really have anything to confess. And I find myself saying, oh, really? Let me, let me give you a few choices, because uh, uh, how, how could you possibly be without sin? Uh, even the greatest saints have recognized their sinfulness. In fact, the more we appreciate the love of God in our life, the more we begin to realize how really how selfish and self-centered we are uh, and how unworthy we really are of God's love. Failure to recognize sin in our lives is, I, I think, ultimately a failure to adequately reflect on our attitudes, values, behavior, and experiences uh, of our lives. Uh, this is something, uh, it's a theme that will be running through my whole presentation here. and It, it basically is this, that I think in our culture today, um, we've lost the art of contemplation. It's so hard for people to simply be still and to think quietly, to reflect upon their lives. I recall with, uh, in, in working with a small group of eighth graders, I asked them to, uh, to, to reflect upon uh, their experience of their past, uh, their past week. They had no idea what I was even talking about. I had to give them several examples it's just something that we're for, we've forgotten to do. And if we don't have that kind of reflection, the inner uh, inventory, you might say, of our own lives, uh, well, naturally, then, yeah, then we're probably going to say, well, I have nothing to confess.
So failure then to recognize sin is really a, a sign of an uninformed conscience. Failure to recognize and own up to sin is a, a sign really of a, of a weak prayer life and really not much contemplation at all. So let's turn to the, the hopefulness in this whole picture. Uh, let's look at, uh, you know, how do we turn the corner then when we feel that we're out of sorts, when we recognize that our own sins have uh, ruptured our communion with God, when our own sins have, have left us hungry for peace, uh, where do we go with that? Well, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it, to reflect upon the, the first, uh, really, uh, message of the, of the risen Christ. Do you recall how in John's Gospel, uh, Jesus uh, appears to his apostles and it, it, it says in the Gospel, on the evening of that first day of the week, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Shalom, peace be with you. Uh, mind you, again he says in John 14, uh, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give you a peace as the world gives it, however. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What a beautiful message. Isn't that a message that has to be heard today in our society? Uh, how meaningful that is, really. In John 20, uh, 22, he says to his apostles, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So first, he gives them his peace. Secondly, he invites his apostles, he commandates his apostles to go forward and to share that peace through the forgiveness of sins. Jesus reconciles the world to God by his cross and resurrection. The peace that he gives us is a peace that he died for. Jesus continues his ministry of mercy and forgiveness through the ministry of the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit. It'd be foolish for us, wouldn't it, to think that, uh, that the Son of God became man and exercised his ministry uh, for only a few years in a, in a rather small demographic area, Galilee, Jerusalem, Capernaum. Uh, no, what Jesus began, he intended to continue, and he continues his ministry through the church. So how can we be saved then? How do we uh, take, accept, and, and find and, uh, this, this gift of peace for ourselves? Well, first of all, um, you know, the first response uh, to Jesus' invitation is a response of conversion, repentance, and baptism. Um, in Acts 2, uh, the crowd gathered around Peter and the other apostles uh, say to them, what are we to do? And Peter's response is very simple but very direct. You must reform and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that your sins may be forgiven. So this is the way in which we accept this gift of peace, this gift of salvation. By conversion, convert, changing our lives, reorienting our lives um, through repentance, a, a willingness to, again, uh, make changes in our behavior and baptism. The early church, of course, uh, saw this uh, practice of baptism then as something uh, that was uh, very, to be taken very seriously. Uh, that's why it took at least three years of preparation for someone who was preparing for baptism, because it, it was not just a, a head trip of saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but rather it was a yes to following his way, not my own. It was a yes and a willingness to change one's life, to, to walk in his footsteps. And one doesn't, you know, make that change or accept that call uh, in 24 hours, three weeks, or four weeks, whatever. Uh, it takes a long while to change one's life to follow Christ. Today, in the right of, through the rite of Christian initiation of adults, we've returned to that wonderful uh, and powerful uh, invitation to baptism, again, not as something that is just routine or token, but something that calls us to a, a deep conversion of life. Uh, and that's why through the 
rite of Christian initiation of adults or the catechumenate, um, we've seen that it, it takes at least a minimum of a year uh, and even longer. And that's true, let me say, also for children of catechetical age too. What hopefully we can see in all of this from the, from the, early, from the scriptures and the life of the early church is that baptism was understood truly as a radical act. It was truly a rebirth, a purification, a new life, a new relationship with God and with the community. Well, the expectation was, of course, that if you were baptized then, then sin was, should not be a problem any longer. You've been converted, so I uh, don't have to worry about that. Well, uh, the human dimension, of course, uh, enters in here, and early on uh, the church saw, uh, experienced, that, you know, in spite of sincerity and being baptized, sin does enter our lives. So what do we do then? Well, St. Ambrose had a good way of putting it. He said the church is blessed with the, both the sacraments, the sacrament of water and the sacrament of tears. Water and tears, water meaning baptism, in tears, that forgiveness of sins through the sacrament of penance. One of the early church fathers, Tertullian, put it this way, that um, the sacrament of penance is the second plank of salvation after the shipwreck, which is the loss of grace. Shipwreck is a, is, is a great uh, image to use in thinking of our lives as a baptized person who, who goes, uh, goes astray. In either case, um, uh, the way we need to look at uh, the sacrament of reconciliation is to look at it in relationship to the sacrament of baptism, because it's in, bapti in the um, sacrament of penance that we return to baptismal innocence. And um, uh, that's very important for us to, to recognize. Now. Uh, as we celebrate, you know, often enough you hear people talking about the sacrament of penance and reconciliation in many different ways. There's a lot of uh, popular names for this sacrament, and it's understanding because it's a rich mystery, and uh, there's a generous outpouring of grace, um, confession, conversion to God, second baptism, repentance, change of heart, reconciliation with the church, sacrament of forgiveness and mercy, sacrament of healing. You know, whatever way we choose to refer to the sacrament of penance, it is, again, a return to our baptismal innocence. We're restored to that wonderful state of grace that we first found in baptism. So how do we prepare for that sacrament of penance? Well, again, uh, as I said, the theme running through this is uh, the importance of personal reflection and prayer, an examination of conscience. This is not a checklist like a, making a grocery list. It's much more inclusive. It looks at our lives uh, as a whole. Yes, there's going to be particular uh, things we have done or failed to do, um, but can we pick out a certain direction we're headed? Uh, where are our values? So questions that we're going to ask ourselves are, are have, I, have I lived my vocation as a disciple of Jesus? You know, it's all nice language to, to, call, to talk about discipleship in Christ Jesus, but a, a disciple is one who follows the Master. Have we? Have I remained rooted in God? Is God really at the center of my life? Or is he kind of an afterthought? Or do I only run to God when there's a problem? Uh, am I truly rooted in God? Have I loved God and neighbor? You know, it's, again, easy enough to say, um, but what about dealing with difficult people? Is there, there's no exception that I can find in the scriptures when Jesus says, love God and neighbor. And what are my sins of omission? Uh, I think I would say that, uh, well, I'm speaking for myself now as a sinner, uh, as I prepare for the sacrament of penance, I, I think my list uh, of sins of omission are always uh, longer than and, and sometimes greater than my sins of commission. How does, how does a review of the commandments and the Beatitudes uh, tell me something about my life? Uh, these are things to reflect upon. 
what are the graces I've experienced and what are the missed opportunities? In other words, has God been chasing after me all along, but I keep running in a different direction? Do I have my hands on my ears so I don't want to listen to God? Am I paying attention at all to what God has to say to me? What are the recurring sins of my life? You know, often enough, this is a great cross we bear. And when we come to confess our sins, we find ourselves saying the same thing. What are the obstacles that keep us from living for God? Are we too caught up in our own glorification? Is pleasure the first principle of our life? Is busyness ruining our lives? And what is disturbing my peace? Can I name it? Can I name the sin, really? Can, is there someone that can help me, perhaps, to, to name that sin in my life? Am I open to that? And what is my relationship with the church and its mission? You know, there are some people who will say, well, I love Jesus and I, uh, I believe in Jesus, but I have no use for the church. Well, that's really an impossible thing to say because Jesus is inseparable from his church. The church is the body of Christ. You can't, you can't separate yourself from the church. Now, all of these, this, these questions here that I've placed as a possible examine are uh, a sampling, really. Again, in that rite of penance, you'll find other examines. But the point is this, that you can't make that kind of an examination 10 minutes before you walk in to celebrate the sacrament. This should be a lifestyle, and, and in particular, before celebrating that sacrament, it may be at least days that you begin to reflect upon this as best you can. So let's look at the specific steps in the sacrament of, of penance and, and uh, maybe just a few comments about each of those steps. I'm, you know, I know you're familiar with them, uh, but, but just to look at them a little bit more closely. So the first thing is you know, just stepping into that uh, confession experience, whether it's in a closed confessional or reconciliation room or could be any place. Uh, I find it helpful to uh, to use uh, w our imagination here and to think about some of the gospel stories as you prepare to walk into that sacrament. Um, think of the stories of Jesus uh, with sinners. Uh, Jesus calling Zacchaeus out of a tree and saying, tonight I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. Boy, didn't that shock the establishment. Or Jesus approaching the woman at the well. Or Jesus having dinner with tax collectors and people who were known to be outcasts and sinners. And now it's your turn. Now you get to walk into that confessional experience. We're, we're part of a history, you might say, of sinners lined up to, to, to sit at table with Jesus. The priest confessor who welcomes you uh, acts in persona Christi, in other words, in the person of Christ. Seeing him, hearing him, the voice of Christ, uh, welcoming you. The priest may offer a short blessing to get started, um, but in, in that welcome, really see Christ uh, in your in our midst. The second uh, piece, of course, is the sign of the cross. Uh, here's a connection again uh, to baptism. You know, the, one of the, the first liturgical gesture that is given an individual uh, is the sign of the cross. Both for adults and infants, the cross is signed on our bodies. We're marked with the sign of the cross, a sign of salvation. And so here again, we begin with the sign of the cross. And you can begin uh, confession by simply uh, saying something like, bless me, Father, I have sinned against God. My last confession was uh, three weeks uh, or nine months or five years, whatever it is. It's helpful for the confessor to hear that because then what you're going to have to say can be put into a, a better context. Now what happens uh, if it's been a, a very long time since your last confession and uh, maybe you really feel very embarrassed and uh, even frightened, you know, is the priest going to kind of uh, um, chast you know, chastise you for, for being away for so long? It's my experience and I, I would say the experience of my brother priests, that it'd be, it's quite the contrary, uh, that we would uh, lash out at a, a sinner who hasn't been to confession in a long time. In fact, it's, uh, it, it's a great uh, uh, 
experience of joy to welcome someone who's been away for a while. You know, it's like that story of the, the 99, the shepherd leaving the 99 to go for the one sheep that is lost and brings him home on, the, on his shoulders. Uh, it's a great experience. So there should be no fear there at all. It's, it's, it's a happy and wonderful uh, experience to welcome a sinner. Uh, what if I panic and forget what to say? Well, I, I think that can be uh, <laughs> very natural too. You know, when it all comes down to it, maybe a good thing is if you're a catechist to, to teach others is to say, if you panic and you don't know what to say, just say that to the priest. Say that, you know, I'm, I'm nervous and I don't know where to begin. Can you help me? Um, you know, we don't have to be slavish to a, a, a particular format. The priest is there to, to help you. So the third piece then is, of course, confession itself. We tell our sins to the priest as best we can. Uh, trying to focus especially on those that are uh, most grave. Um, we try to give the priest some indication of how frequently and to what extent uh, or degree we've been, that those sins have been part of our experience. And uh, hopefully, uh, again, as catechist uh, or as a parent, uh, to remind uh, others about the seal of the sacrament that guarantees confidentiality. Uh, that they need not be afraid. This is taken very, very seriously. Uh, I don't know of any priest who, who has ever broken that uh, great uh, seal of, of, of confession. Um, when you're done, uh, it's always helpful for the priest to know that uh, there are no other sins to confess. So to just simply say, and these are all the sins that I, that I can remember, Father, or something like that. Now, again, what happens if you can't uh, think of any sins to confess? Um, well, I guess it goes back to was your examination of conscience uh, adequate? Um, that's a part of the picture. Uh, but try to focus on the patterns in your life. Um, where do you find yourself most frequently falling? What happens if you forget to include some sins before you leave uh, the priest? As long as you intended to say uh, all of your sins, uh, they are forgiven. Now, if it's a serious sin, you can uh, repeat it to the, in your next confession, but you should have confidence that your sins are forgiven as long as you didn't purposely omit some sins. And what is the value? This is a question um, that many ask. What's the value or the difference between confessing your faults to another person rather than simply uh, speaking to God in the secret, uh, secret, secretly in your own heart. Well, you know, I, think about it. I, I think it's easy to deceive ourselves in the quietness of our hearts, isn't it? Um, I mean, I find myself just as an example sometimes I find myself saying, yeah, you know, I really got to go on a diet. I'm really going to go on a diet. Uh, nobody hears that, so nobody's going to hold me accountable either. Uh, but if I were to say it around my friends, I think the, the next week they'd be saying, well, how's your diet going, right? Um, in other words, uh, to admit our faults to another takes us to another level of sincerity and humility uh, that uh, may not be so easily reached just simply in the privacy of our own hearts. Uh, and so uh, there's a certain, when we hear ourselves speak our own sins, Something there's a different dynamic at work there that is uh, uh, really powerful, and the other thing is uh, is that as a human person we need to hear those words. I absolve you. You are forgiven. Um, when you just to simply uh, in the secretness of your own heart say to God, I'm sorry, uh, you don't quite have that experience. So there's a real value to that. The next uh, aspect of uh, celebrating the sacrament is satisfaction and penance. Um, the confessor may offer you some pastoral counsel. Uh, he will propose uh, an act of penance, uh, which we also call satisfaction. He may suggest a prayer, a work of charity, or some other personal act of discipline. Uh, the idea is that through action uh, we, we show the sincerity of, uh, of our sorrow for sin and also uh, doing something positive kind of turn things around and, and move us in a new direction. 
accepting the penance is a sign that uh, you are sincere about changing your life <clears throat> and that you're going to do your best to eliminate those sins in the, in the future. It's interesting to note, you know, that in the early church, in the first experiences uh, of uh, celebrating this sacrament, uh, it was the practice to do the penance first and then come back for the absolution. In other words, the church wanted to see, are you in fact going to change your life? Are you worthy? Are you sincere about this? So uh, really, we have it pretty easy, you might say, to celebrate the sacrament today. Um, some a ask, however, is what happens if I forget my penance or, um, or if I forget to perform my penance? Uh, well, as, again, as long as we didn't neglect the penance intentionally, there's no need to worry. But perform a penance that you feel then fits your sin. And, uh, and if you're still feeling a little uncomfortable about all of that, the next time you go to confession, you can mention that. Um, but again, it's, it's the sincerity of, of your heart and the willingness to change that makes the difference. Finally, the priest will ask you to pray an act of contrition. And uh, this prayer is, once again, another sign that acknowledges your spirit of repentance. It gives voice to your, your sin. Uh, your willingness to uh, turn from sin. Uh, some ask, well, gee, I can't remember an act of contrition. Um, well, a couple things we could do with there. Uh, uh, in, uh, in my parish, uh, we have these little cards uh, that have an act of contrition on them, and we just place them in the confessional. And I find that I don't have to say a word, but people uh, kneeling there see the card, and they, they immediately use that. Or they make up their own prayer, which is fine. Um, in that rite of penance, uh, mind you, there are uh, uh, several options for an act of contrition. Um, it could be as simple as uh, uh, the act of contrition that's taken from Luke chapter 15. Father, I have sinned against you. I no longer deserve to be called your child. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, I like to encourage people to make their own act of contrition. And although it often is much simpler than the formal act of contrition, Often I hear in, in their prayer uh, a real contrite heart. The, uh, the heart of the sacrament, of course, is the absolution. Here we have the Easter gift of Christ being extended to you as the priest raises his hand over your head and pronounces the words of sacramental absolution. Uh, and at the end, uh, you respond, Amen. Let's look at the words of that prayer of absolution. and. Uh, what I would uh, suggest is when you're catechizing um, to, to really go through this prayer, and you'll see the little boxes and lines that I've drawn uh, from that uh, prayer uh, of absolution, um, as a, just as an example of uh, doing a little uh, catechesis on the prayer. Uh, there are some great lines in this that gives you the whole theology, you might say, of the sacrament of penance. God the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son. So how are we saved? How are our sins forgiven? We are saved by the fruit of Christ's cross and resurrection. And is reconciled the world to himself. To recognize that in Christ's saving act, all creation has been restored uh, in Christ. And sent the Holy Spirit among us. Remember, this takes us back again to Easter night, the risen Lord appearing to his apostles and uh, giving that gift of Pentecost uh, to, the, to the church so that whenever we call upon the Holy Spirit, the ministry of Jesus is continued, as we see in the, in the next line of the prayer, through the ministry of the church, it's con Jesus' uh, ministry is continued. May God give you pardon and peace. Oh, there's that word again, isn't it? We return again, that word peace. We've been longing for peace. Well, may God give you pardon and peace. Again, not as the world gives it, but as Jesus alone can give it. And I absolve you. Okay? I absolve you. You're restored to your baptismal innocence. Um, it's a beautiful prayer, and I, I don't neglect... Uh, you know, taking the prayer apart and talking about it if you're a catechist so that uh, others can uh, understand and appreciate it all the more. Um, some other questions sometimes that arise from, uh, is, what if I'm not truly sorry uh, for, uh, for what I did? Um, well, you know, then there's a, an issue there. 
uh, you know, we may feel that uh, you've got to understand that it may we may have a feeling like uh, I don't know if I can change. Well, you can't be absolutely certain that you are going to change, but you have to be willing to change. There has to be a desire to change, and that's what that sorrow for sin really means. What happens if I feel I'm confessing the same thing over and over? Should I stop confessing my sins? No, uh, because uh, things could be worse if you if you did that. Uh, at least by constantly confessing the same sins, uh, we're being reminded to, to stay on track. Sometimes people also ask as well, or you know, they're not so sure about the holiness of the priest to whom they they confess. Remember that you know God alone forgives sins, and. Uh, as long as the priest does what the church intends in this sacrament, you can be sure that the forgiveness and mercy of God through Christ is being given uh, to you. At the end of uh, the uh, toward the end of the celebration, then once uh, uh, you've been absolved, uh, the priest may praise the the mercy of God in words such as "Give thanks to the Lord for He is good." The penitent may answer, his mercy endures forever. Uh, and then the dismissal, uh, the priest will conclude the celebration of the sacrament by saying, go in peace. And uh, again, uh, a, a wonderful opportunity for us. Uh, what are the, the ways in which we celebrate this sacrament? Well, uh, privately, of course, face-to-face, uh, -face, either behind a screen, uh, um, or behind a screen, and, and that's scheduled times in the, that a parish provides. Um, perhaps at a communal celebration with prayer and scripture and the opportunity to confess your sins privately and receive individual absolution. And any time, really, by special arrangement with a priest, or perhaps you're on a retreat or in the hospital, don't ever hesitate to ask a priest uh, at these kind of occasions, uh, would it be possible, Father, for you to hear my confession, to celebrate the sacrament? Um, so uh, there are many uh, different opportunities. I want to say a little something, uh, well, the few minutes that we have left about special concerns with children. And everything I've said so far uh, certainly does apply to children. You have to kind of adapt it to their own uh, uh, age appropriate. But perhaps I, you know, it'd be important to say this if you're a catechist. Don't see yourself as a teacher. Try to understand yourself as a spiritual director, a pastoral minister in this regard. A teacher, often enough, um, has the connotation, anyway, of, of simply uh, passing on information. And you're doing that. But as a catechist, you're doing something more. You're helping to form the conscience of that child. Uh, and that's a pastoral act, a pastoral ministry. So part of that means emphasizing Christ's peace uh, and our reconciliation with God as a great gift. Emphasize that this is not a uh, the sac this is not called the sacrament of punishment, but the sacrament of healing. It's very helpful, I find, to role play the sacramental ritual, uh, preferably uh, with the parish priest. Uh, with the parish priest only because eventually the children will face the priest and sometimes there's a, just a fear or uh, a mystique uh, that has to be uh, broken down there. Also let the children choose their own confessor if possible um, and their own way if they wish to confess behind the screen or face to face. I, I personally try to encourage the children to go face to face and I'll tell you why. Uh, because children do not have the facility of language that adults do. And when children come to me face to face, I can read uh, their thoughts and uh, their emotions by, by just by looking at them. And also by, by my being able to offer them a smile uh, or to uh, shake their hand or whatever it is as they enter, uh, some of the fear gets um, put, put aside. One of the things as a catechist or a parent that I strongly encourage uh, is to uh, invite uh, the children um, into a nightly practice of, uh, of praying and, and doing two things with their prayer. First of all, thanking God for the good gifts of the day, and secondly, seeking forgiveness uh, for sins committed or opportunities missed. 
Um, so it's a, it's a nightly exam. And uh, if you do this more regularly and on a regular basis, even if it's just a few minutes each night, one gets into the habit and, and uh, is more conscious of, of one's both good gifts and of which you thank God and also for those things for which we're sorry. You know, when I try to explain to children what an examination of conscience is, one of the images I use sometimes is, uh, is a sports image. You know, often enough, uh, like in a professional, let's just say professional football, uh, the coach will uh, regroup his, uh, his team and he replays the whole game for the players. And I ask the children, why, why does he do that? And inevitably, they catch it. They say, well, because they can see what they did wrong and what they could do better to win the game the next time. I say, well, that's exactly what we do in our examination of conscience. Let the children, of course, uh, memorize an act of contrition. This is very helpful. Uh, and to use it regularly in the classroom or for, as a parent, to use it at home uh, before bed. Uh, also encourage children to make their own prayer if they're comfortable doing so. Um, again, remind children about the sacramental seal that assures them of confidentiality. Uh, and another thing I think uh, with very young children is to help them to understand the difference between an uh, accident uh, and a willful act. And so sometimes a child will come to me in confessional and say, uh, and I was washing dishes and I broke a favorite dish of my mother. Uh, well, uh, it's not a sin. They, they're sorry. They're regretful for that. But to help them to understand they didn't do that in purpose. It wasn't a willful intent. So they need a little help sometimes to clarify some of that. And, of course, uh, as we're pastoring and catechizing, to encourage parents to celebrate the sacrament as well. So as we conclude, maybe just to look at the value of, uh, of celebrating the sacrament, uh, you know, why, uh, why is it important for us to, to celebrate the sacrament? Well, let's go back to the very beginning of this presentation, uh, recognizing that, uh, that we all seek peace in our lives. Uh, we're looking for that peace that, that runs so deep, and a peace that is often, uh, you know, destroyed by our own um, poor acts, uh, our attitudes, um, and so the value of the sacrament is that we're given the forgiveness of our sins, uh, we receive a grace that restores our relationship with God and, and leads us to peace. The celebrating the sacrament is also a, a step that we use in the, um, the growth of our spiritual life. By f frequently reflecting on the gospel, making a good examination of conscience, is making that again a part of our life, rooting out what is harmful in our life. Um, the, the sacrament moves us in that direction, keeps that uh, movement alive in us. And also, uh, the sacrament prevents us from keeping us uh, uh, from, from sin sinning in the future. If, if we've, again, given voice to our sins, we're more attentive uh, of our sins, and that, in turn, uh, reminds us about the direction we must go in the future. Uh, there is, in this sacrament, truly a spiritual in, an impetus to move forward. Uh, again, uh, you know, one of the things that I find people sometimes have a difficulty with is, you know, uh, there's a question of, you know, can God ever forgive me for, for the terrible sins that I've committed? And I, I always say to folks, uh, I'd like you to spend some time with the Bible, and, and I dare you to find a passage anywhere where the Lord says something like, uh, you know, well, I know what you did, and I'm not going to forget that. God doesn't do that. God wants us to move forward, wants to free us. His love frees us to move us into the future. Uh, when we hear a voice inside telling us, oh, I know who you are, you know, I know what you've done, that's not God saying that to us. It's often the evil one trying to move us away from embracing the mercy and forgiveness of God. And finally, you know, we celebrate this sacrament because it is liturgy. It's an act of worship. We praise God for his mercy. This is why we come. We thank God for his, the, sa his, the saving death and resurrection of Christ, um, which reminds me, you know, so often with children, they're so afraid of what they're going to say and, what, you know, that they're going to forget to say this or that. I always tell them what's most important is not what you're going to say, but what God is going to say 
to you. You are forgiven. I love you. The sacrament of penance makes, uh, is really a way of life. Uh, it's not just uh, an isolated sacramental moment. It fits into a much bigger picture of our whole life. And that's why it's important to, to celebrate this sacrament regularly. And finally, uh, the sacrament prepares us for the, for the new evangelization because uh, having celebrated that sacrament, we've experienced the goodness and mercy of God, and now we can, in fact, be, be great witnesses of the same. And, that, and you know, when it's not just an intellectual thing, this new evangelization. It's sharing the mercy and forgiveness of God that we've experienced in our own lives. How are we going to do that? How are we going to pass that on in the new evangelization if we haven't experienced it ourselves through this wonderful sacrament? So I think, I, Debbie, I think maybe I better stop there. Uh, we've got some pastoral questions here. Uh, I just want to maybe just, just address two of them, uh, and, uh, and then the, we can address some of the uh, questions of, of our listeners. You know, one of the things I find uh, in this um, in experience of reconciliation is people um, have a difficult time sometimes forgiving themselves. They may you know, understand that God forgives them, but they have a hard time forgiving themselves. So that becomes a, 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 a work of spiritual companionship, helping someone through that. Or sometimes, um, quite honestly, they, they have to work through a forgiveness of God. Uh, they still have blame in their hearts. Uh, what all of this points to, again, as I said earlier, be more than a teacher of this sacrament. Be a spiritual director. Be a companion that walks with uh, another uh, in helping to celebrate the sacrament. Okay, I better stop there. Uh, you'll see some of these other questions on the screen. If you want to pick up on them, that's fine. But uh, Debbie, what do we have uh, out there? Okay, uh, thank you, Father, uh, very much. Let me pull out some of these questions here. Uh, and, and everybody, I, I understand, I mean, I, I know we're at the, um, at the hour. Um, I'll, if you don't mind, we'll just stay on a few, uh, little bit extra minutes to, to run through some of these comments and questions. Uh, if you do need to drop off, we totally understand. I, I hope it's all right with everybody. Um, Let's see. There are, what are some strategies you might suggest as catechists in which we can use with our students to help them in developing the practice of reconciliation? For example, what did you do with the eighth grade students to help them in their recollection of, the pa of their past week? Well, I think... Um there's a, a couple of things. Again, it's really teaching them the, the art of contemplation. Some of that comes through Alexio Divina, um, by uh, listening more carefully to the scriptures. Uh, much of it comes uh, simply by giving them examples and uh, by taking an experience uh, that they may have shared and then taking it apart, uh, trying to make connections uh, for instance, uh, you know, is there anything in your experience that reminds you of a gospel story in some ways? Um, so uh, I, I think it's it, it, the biblical piece. I think is very important. The biblical connections, uh, so that when we uh, read some scripture, again, the question is, uh, when you hear this passage, you know, what do you hear God asking you to do? Or how do you? What do you think God is asked? How God is asking you to respond? And then the question: Have you? Uh, have you responded generously and, and faithfully? So it, it's it's giving them uh, on a regular basis. And this is why I say it. It, it can't just be you know tomorrow where our class is going to celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation. So today let's let's make a review. That's fine, uh, but it has to be on a more regular basis. So maybe even once a week we take 10 minutes and just, just to take one, one piece, not everything, maybe to, to take one of the commandments or one of the Beatitudes or, or a statement of Jesus, uh, you know, uh, what, whatever it is from Scripture, and to talk about it a little bit and then to ask them how would people uh, either follow or ignore this teaching of Jesus. 
and, and they get it. Uh, it. It just takes a little while for them to become more comfortable with that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, those, for those of you who had asked, the absolution prayer with the highlighted points explaining the prayer will be sent to you as a handout. Um, uh, let me see. Another one. The sacrament of anointing, isn't that also a sacrament of healing? Yes, it is. Uh, so uh, it is a sacrament of healing in, in a different sort of way. Um, you know, it, it, you might say in some ways that all the sacraments are sacraments of healing in some way or another. Uh, they put us in right relationship with God. Uh, and it's also correct to say that um, the other sacraments, for instance, the celebration of the Eucharist in particular, is, is likewise a, a sacrament of forgiveness. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, how often throughout, you know, throughout the Mass, uh, um, we, we hear those words of forgiveness. And in the Eucharistic prayer itself, uh, uh, you know, this, this is my body given for you, my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, you know. Uh, so uh, it, it's not like the sacraments uh, um, are, are, are so entirely unique that there aren't these other aspects attached. Because ultimately, all the sacraments aim at the same thing, namely to be in communion with God to be in the right relationship with God. Uh, so yes, there are those elements that are overlapping, but in the sacrament of penance, we focus very directly and, and very intensely uh, on um, that examination of, of conscience and, and our own sinfulness. Okay, thank you. Um, when a child goes for their first confession, some feel they have a lot of sins to tell. Are there certain sins they should focus on and only tell some, or should they tell all of the sins they can remember? Well, uh, if it's children, I don't find that experience to be true. Uh, most uh, will uh, um, have very little to tell, maybe one or two things. Uh, maybe adults, uh, that might be the case. Um, in either case, if, if that is an issue, then again, it's, if there is some very specific, serious sin, those things should be mentioned uh, by name. Uh, but otherwise, it might be more of a, of a pattern. So for instance, um, you know, with, with children even, let's say, or, or adults, uh, one could say, I have a terrible habit of lying every time uh, I'm confronted by something, as opposed to saying, I lied on Tuesday because so-and-so said this, and then on Thursday I lied again because blah, 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 blah. Um, so we have to teach them uh, to, it's harder on younger kids uh, to teach that kind of aspect because they're, they're much more literal uh, about things. Uh, they have a hard time of kind of uh, putting things together in a more generic fashion. Um, but uh, uh, so it's important to catch the pattern. Okay, um, and sometimes what I do as a confessor is I'll go back to to the penitent and say, and especially with children, to say, okay, if there was one thing that you felt that you really had to work on, uh, you know, after this confession and uh, as you move forward, what would that be? Then often enough, the child picks out for himself or herself what has precisely been the sin that they've been. Uh, so it's like you have to ask them the question in different ways uh, to get at, get at those answers. Okay, uh, two questions. I'm going to combine them into one, uh, and then maybe we'll take one more. Uh, first, I'll also comment. Uh, thank you, everybody. These are beautiful comments you're uh, extending to Father, uh, to Father Ron. I'll be sure to email them to him so that he sees them. Um, uh, thank you. Father, you would... You think you felt like a four-star general at the beginning? What do you mean? Some of the seventh. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, here's a. I ask, now, this is a question for you as a pastor. There's a, two questions. Um, are there any consistent behaviors of a parish that has a high attendance of penance and confessions? What drives one parish more so to go to confession than others? And then the second is, how can you encourage your own parish? Uh, pastor to, um, with positive feedback, so the priest will offer confession more often. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think we do have to talk about it more, uh, certainly in homilies, at least to make reference, so not necessarily, uh, you know, 
devoting an entire homily to the sacrament. They're constantly making reference to the sacrament uh, and encouraging people uh, in that way, uh, certainly through the bulletin, or perhaps having something on the parish website where someone can go at their own leisure and kind of uh, review a little bit of you know, the value and, and uh, the, uh, the ritual itself to make them feel more comfortable. Uh, and, and also just at, at other opportunities that we have to, to speak or to catechize. I, I think uh, one of the things that's always a problem for a pastor is to try to figure out what is a good time for people uh, to celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And uh, quite honestly, it, 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 it has to be kind of a uh, uh, trial and error. Uh, I suggest you just kind of, over a period of time, try different times and see what happens. Um, you know, I find it difficult to simply hear confessions on a Saturday evening before the evening mass, because then I'm always feeling a little rushed and nervous. What if I have too many penitents and I got to get out of there to say to celebrate the mass? So we need to think of other opportunities, and uh, it, it just I think you just got to listen. I mean, there's one parish in my diocese that has a lot of young adults, and uh, they try to uh, kind of, uh, write a, a penitential service. Uh, at I think it was like nine or ten o'clock at night, and when I first heard that, I thought they were crazy. Uh, but they had a, a, a large number of young people who actually came at that time. Their day is over, and that fits their lifestyle. So uh, I, I think we just have to experiment and maybe ask the people themselves. You know, what would be a convenient time for them? Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, and then we'll close. And then for the others of you who we do not address your question, we will answer you. Um, offline through email. Um, I have been a, um, I have been a, uh, several first confessions for children that were troubling. One of the most troubling aspects is that parents walk their child to the co uh, confessor who is seated in the sanctuary. The parent is to introduce the child to the priest and step back a few feet. The children are lined up and told which priest to go to. What can be done in schools and religious education programs to model a more realistic practice that will accommodate confessions in the future? Well, I, I think those are concerns. Um, I think the child, the child does have a fear uh, that their parents are going to hear them. Uh, and uh, I find that they are, uh, they're actually more, generally speaking, more comfortable if the parent just steps aside entirely out of the picture. Um, so uh, I understand uh, the, the personal aspect of that, um, but certainly they're not always going to have their parent coming to present uh, them to the priest. So I, I, yeah, I'm not so sure I care for that practice myself. Um, and uh, what was the second part of that? Uh, the, um, uh -huh. Let me go back and get it out. Um, oh, uh, then the children are lined up and told which priest to go oh, to. Yeah, I just don't like that. You know, I, I just think that. For the child. Yeah, I think you know, for whatever reason, they you know, they they should be encouraged to go to any priest, but on the but at the same time, they need to go to whomever they're going to feel comfortable, especially as young children who are, you know. Uh, and that's why, you know, obviously for the priests, it's 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 valuable if they've had if they know who he is, they've seen him before, or he's been in the classroom, or or something like that. Uh, that can be more helpful. Uh, but uh, to the to the extent that it's possible, I, I really uh, prefer that that they have their choice, uh, just as the adults should have their choice as well. Okay. Uh, we're 10 minutes uh, past the hour. Father, I'm going to ask you to close, and then I'll close off okay. the presentation, if you don't mind, everybody. All right. Uh, again, I'd like to close with a very brief prayer from that rite of penance. And, uh, and again, with another plug, if you haven't looked at the rite of penance in a long time, uh, get a copy of that and uh, look at the, the wealth of goodness in there. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your loving forgiveness knows no limits. You took our human nature to give us an example of humility and to make us faithful in every trial. May we never lose the gifts you have given us. 
But if we fall into sin, lift us up by your gift of repentance. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you all, and I hope that uh, you too, uh, listeners, uh, will find the value and uh, the goodness in this sacrament uh, for your own spiritual journey. Oh, thank you. It, it was wonderful. And um, oh, I shouldn't have closed that one question out. Uh, I'll pull it out before before we shut down. Uh, just as I mentioned, uh, we at Sally, we have three different blogs, one in Spanish and two in English, with um, um, amazing resources. The first takes you into uh, activities and resources to use uh, for the classroom in your lessons. Uh, that would be the Sadly We Believe blog. The second, We Believe in Share, is written by Kathy Hendricks with uh, delightful and inspirational um, writings and, and uh, prayer downloads that you can use uh, with your parish meetings, with your catechists, um, sent home to parents. Um, and then the third is the same as the We Believe in Share blog, is Cremos y Compartimos com, and that's written by our, our uh, Spanish uh, writers and consultants, uh, Dulce Jimenez, Victor Valenzuela, and Sister Rosa Monique Pena. And uh, they too share um, inspirational writing uh, for you. Um, I invite you to join us next week. Where you'll watch your inbox and your emails. Uh, uh, Tom Quinlan from the Diocese of Joliet will be uh, addressing uh, partnering with parents in faith formation. Uh, it's truly to, it, to be uh, something of value and of interest to everybody. Um, and then, uh, oh, your certificates will send you an email. You'll be able to sign up for a certificate. We print them out and we mail them to you. Uh, they're personalized. They will include a copy uh, or a list of your um, the time spent on your webinar as well as the, the title and the date. So uh, just be, be patient. I promise you it will arrive. Uh, it might take a week or two to get through the mail, but it, it definitely uh, will arrive. And I'm looking for that one last comment, um, and I'm so sorry I can't find it. Um, but uh, Father, it was the importance that uh, of how you, as a catechist, you uh, we also uh, work with students and and we bring them to their to mm -hmm. uh, in, into their faith and. Uh, Right, on spiritual that, director you know, for them, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, anyway, thank you, everybody. It's uh, thank you uh, for staying on a little bit longer. Uh, we appreciate your your being with us. And again, we'll answer other questions offline and directly to you. Or if you have others, just send them in to me. Uh, you already have my email address from uh, your registration. And um, I promise I'll get back to you. Alrighty. Uh, thank you, and have a pleasant and blessed good evening. Bye bye. <laughs>